this time on psychic investigators. In an L.A. suburb, a nurse is carjacked. They needed money. Let's go steal it. But where is she? And is she alive or dead? Miles away, a woman is jolted by a vision. Like having an electric shock. I could see where she was. But the police aren't buying it. They think she's guilty. And arresting her for murder. Her vision becomes her nightmare. I could feel something. She's in this canyon. jumped around the car on the driver's side and the other one comes running around on the other side and she was screaming six hours later 5 a.m the la fire department responds to a report of a vehicle on fire in the 1100 block of bromont avenue thinking the truck might be stolen the lapd is notified at 4 30 that same day a distraught woman enters the foothill division of the lapd an individual wanted to speak to a detective about a missing person. Patrick Conmay was a 20-year veteran with the Los Angeles Police Department. I talked to a lady named Shirley Trussell, and she told me about a friend of hers, Melanie Uribe, who had left for work the night before and never arrived. She and other friends had spent the night and most of the day searching for her. At about 3.30 in the afternoon, she had discovered the truck Uribe had was driving on Bromont Street, burned. The same truck that the fire department had responded to at 5 a.m. Melanie Uribe was 31 years old. She was a nurse, she was a single mother, was a very dependable, reliable, responsible individual. I personally, at that point, feel that Melanie Uribe has probably met with some sort of foul play. starts searching for evidence by checking the woman's burnt-out truck, but comes up with nothing. So what we wanted to do now was find whether there were any other witnesses we were unaware of who might have seen more or knew more. The LAPD goes back to interview the witness of the carjacking the night before. He indicated that the truck, after he'd seen it turn right, had pulled to the curb for a, a moment. Police check out the spot and find a box of tissue in the gutter. It was later shown to Melanie Uribe's roommate, and she identified it as having been in the truck. So where is Melanie Uribe? The next day, the police asked the media for help. The police have launched a massive search for the vocational nurse, possibly the largest manhunt for Valley Police. Following a door-to-door -door search in the area yesterday, equestrian patrols set out along the foothills near Lopez Canyon this morning. We focused our attention on Lopez Canyon because Lopez Canyon was a logical location based on the known factors, where the truck was taken, where the truck was burned. It's a remote area that would be a good place to leave somebody. It wasn't the only area we were looking at, but it was an area we were looking at. Ten miles away in a Burbank aerospace plant, a 32-year-old shipping clerk is listening to the news. About 3 o'clock, there was some kind of announcement that they had found this missing lady's vehicle. What happens next turns Etta Smith's life upside down. But then they said they were making a house-to-house -house search. I instantly heard as if someone said to me very clearly, 
she's not in a house. As soon as that thought registered, it was as if I were looking at a, a video or a movie. I didn't know if she needed help or what. No matter what I did, I could get away from it for a minute, but as soon as I had a free space in my head, it would come back to me. Why won't this leave me alone? I knew where she was. In LA, a shipping clerk has a sudden disturbing vision of Melanie Ruiz, a nurse who had been carjacked the night before. I could see where she was. Going up into the canyon, I could see the curve in the road, a dirt path going to her, and a hill behind her. I've never experienced anything like this before in my life, nothing of a criminal element. I have, ever since I was a very small child, seen things before they would happen or seemed to know things that I shouldn't have known. When I shared it with my mother, she said, whatever you do, don't ever tell anybody. I just pretty much kept it to myself. Unable to get the vision of the missing nurse out of her mind, Edna knows this time she has to tell someone. When I get to a certain point, if I turn right, I'm going home. If I turn left, I'm almost immediately in front of the police station. So the argument I'm having with myself is, should I tell them or should I not? They're going to think I'm some kind of a nut. So what? What if you don't tell them and nobody gets to her in time? I couldn't turn my back on that if there was a possibility, the slightest possibility, that I was right. I turn left. At the Foothill Division Police Station, the reluctant psychic speaks to a detective named Lee Ryan. I have something I, I have to tell you, this missing lady. I could see where she was. Can you show me this on a map? And I said, sure. Lopez Canyon is a remote hillside area in the San Gabriel Mountains above Pacoima. He said, you know, we haven't checked that area, but we will. And I remember looking at him and saying, I have the feeling I will, too. My mom came home late, and she had a, you know, a peculiar look on her face, like she was troubled about something. Etta's son, Andy, was nine years old at the time. And her and my cousin started talking about it, about her vision and seeing where this woman was, and kind of freaked me out a little bit. It was about 4, 15, maybe. I wanted to go before it got dark, and this was December. And immediately when I said, I have to go to this place. Curiosity took the best of me, and uh, I wanted to go look too, me and my sister. So we got in the trans van, and we uh, left the house, and we drove to that area where Lopez Canyon is located. We go up Paxton Street, we cross Foothill, we go under the 118 freeway, and there's a sharp left turn that takes you into this canyon. When we started slowly driving up the canyon, she said, keep your eye out, you know, keep an eye open, be looking left to right, tell me if you see anything. And uh, she was all the while, she was just kind of getting a, a feel out the air or something, you know. Just looking around, trying to, trying to catch whatever it was she saw, I guess. We slowly just made our way up the canyon, which was probably about three miles to the top. We pull over. And I'm looking around to see if I see anything. And I said, you know, I don't see anything, but I feel her. She's in this canyon. My mom was truly convinced we were in the right spot. It's got to be back down the hill. We started to wake our way down. We were just about ready to give up. I noticed tire marks on the left embankment and tire marks on the right side. The area was big enough to where you could pull off and stop. And there's not a lot of areas up there that you can do that in. Something doesn't look right. It, it stood out. It was pronounced. And so I walked over and I laid my fingers into the impressions of the tire tread. I felt trauma, scared. I knew that this was tires from her vehicle. I pulled back onto the roadway. had only gone about maybe 25, 30 feet. 
my sister actually saw something off to the left. She said, wait a minute, Mom, I see something. From there, we started to, one by one, go out. The way it looked was just eerie. An open row with bushes on both sides. To me, it kind of looked like a church aisle, you know, with, like, the bushes being pews. I was only nine years old, <laughs> so it, it was kind of weird. And then there she was. When my eyes get to the end of this object I'm looking at, she had on white nurse's shoes. And I said, oh, my God. My mom and my cousin freaked out and started running. You know, me being so young, I'm, I'm going to run, too. I said, I've got to get to the police. As they head down the canyon, by chance, Etta spots an LAPD cruiser coming up the canyon. I blew my horn, threw on my brakes, flagged him down. And I told him, look, we've just found somebody's body. He comes back, and he says, well, it is a body. And I said, is it the nurse? He said, in all probability, I think so. Anna Smith has found what an entire police force has been searching for. I came to the station, and Ryan contacted me and told me that a woman had come in, a woman named Etta Smith, and told him she thought the body might be located somewhere up in Lopez Canyon. Within 30 minutes, I was notified that the body had been found in Lopez Canyon. Conway then heads to Lopez Canyon to meet with the officer who takes him to the body. And what I saw was a white female laying face down with significant head trauma. And there wasn't any doubt in my mind that she had been murdered. I then directed officers to secure that location for the night because I didn't feel I could do an adequate crime scene. It's not possible for the investigating officer to do every step of the investigation. You have to use other resources, other detectives who are just as capable as you are. Conway sends detectives to talk with Etta Smith about her so-called psychic vision. It went on for hours. It went on till 10.30, maybe at night. I don't think they're believing me. I kept telling them the same thing. But this one officer, he became really belligerent through a chair and raised his voice to intimidate me. What, you think I'm involved in this? If I was capable of this, my husband would have been dead a long time ago. I'll take a, a lie detector test. I'll prove to you. I, I don't know anything about this other than what I've told you. They take her up on the offer. They said, you failed. Her children are brought in for questioning. Still remember this guy. Gives me a lollipop, you know, and asks me a few questions. I'm answering now because I, I feel comfortable. But uh, apparently it wasn't the answers he wanted to hear. And he just switched on me like that and he started yelling at me and went from good cop to bad cop, as they say, and just totally scared me. Scared me to death, you know? Yeah, I want my mama. I don't want, I don't know, I'm done. I wanted to keep my lollipop, but I was done. Etta had said that when she drove up the canyon, she didn't see anything. And as she came back down the canyon, I think the eight-year-old announced that she saw something off the road. When the detectives interviewed the other individuals, they were not saying that the discovery occurred exactly that way. It made the individuals talking to her skeptical. At that point, all conversation was over. They transported me to the Van Nuys jail, and I was booked and put in a cell. In an L.A. suburb, a psychic finds the body of missing nurse Melanie Uribe. Now she finds herself accused of murder. I am strip searched. I am cavity searched. I try to do the right thing, and I end up in jail. Last evening, just before dark, person other than police personnel uh, discovered the body. When I get back to the station and I can sit down and uh, contact the coroner, uh, I probably will have some more information in, in another hour or two. I didn't even know that she had been arrested. Someone told me that while I'm doing the crime scene. That caused me some concern because it had been my hope to, as time permitted, to eventually interview her in an effort to find out 
how she knew the information she knew. When I was told she was in jail, I believed that interview would be difficult because she likely would have uh, contacted an attorney at that point. I had conversations with people who were involved in the decision to arrest her in an effort to release her. I did not believe for a minute that Etta Smith was involved in the murder. But in order to get the psychic released, the detective needs to find the real killers. He has little evidence except for a tissue box and a vague eyewitness description of the carjackers. December 18th, 1980, 24 hours after the discovery of the body, Conmay gets his first major break. A woman calls, saying she knows who was involved and claims to have the murder weapon. I did not tell her what the weapon was. I said, well, if you have the weapon, I'll know if you're telling the truth, so you tell me what the weapon is. She told me on the phone that the weapon was rock. The coroner's report says the single mother had been beaten to death with a rock the size of a volleyball. She expressed fear from the suspects, ultimately hung up and did not identify herself. December 20th, another informant calls the detective. He says he also knows who was involved in the murder. He ultimately agreed to meet with me in a parking lot. We then interviewed some of the individuals he named. Those individuals provided us with firsthand accounts of what they had been told by one of the suspects. That suspect is 17-year-old Norman Willis of Pacoima. Willis invoked his Fifth Amendment rights and did not speak to us. But Norman Willis's parents do talk. They identify a friend of their son, 20-year-old Lewis Morgan. He had an outstanding traffic warrant, and we arrested him for the traffic warrant. I advised him of his rights, and he waived his rights. Morgan initially denied any knowledge. He ultimately confessed to being involved. I think he just wanted to tell somebody. Lewis Morgan states that on December 15th, he, along with Norman Willis and a third man, 21-year-old Spencer Nelson, decided to rob someone. Melanie Uribe just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Morgan told us that when they stopped on Eustace, Nelson got in the back of the truck with Uribe and raped her. They then all got back in the truck, and they drove up Lopez Canyon. They walked her back off the road into the canyon. As they were walking back, according to Morgan, Nelson told Morgan, we're going to have to kill her. Morgan said that he didn't want to kill her. He just wanted to tie her up. Morgan turned to go back to the truck to get something to tie her up with. And he heard a thump, and he turned around. He saw Uribe laying on the ground, and he saw Nelson striking her several times with a large rock. And they all walked back to the truck, Nelson carrying the rock. According to Morgan, they dropped Willis off at his house. Morgan and Nelson drove the truck to Romont. Nelson set it on fire, and they walked home. Morgan then takes the detective to where they left the rock, in the gutter near his girlfriend's house. But it's gone. On the way back to the station, Conmay remembers the call from the woman informant. And I speculated that the lady that called me was likely his girlfriend, and I returned to the house and confronted her. She said, I will give you the rock, but I have to go to the location by myself. I took the risk and let her do that, and 20 minutes later, she came back with a bloody rock and a pillowcase. Morgan never tells me anything about Annetta Smith or any female being involved. December 21st, 1980, Etta Smith has been in jail for three days. At about 2 o'clock, all of a sudden, somebody appeared at my cell door, unlocked it, and said, come on, you're free to go. I didn't know why. I didn't care why. I just wanted out of there. She just looked pitiful. She looked like she lost weight in three days. And she just looked beat up. I mean, not physically beat up, but just emotionally beat, beat down. It's an experience I hope I never have again. I don't know how people have that experience and then turn around and repeat it and do it again and again. I felt that the case, as we prepared it for court, was pretty solid. The truck was located at the place they said they burned it, and it was burned. The weapon was this rock, and the rock was found where they said they left it, and then a witness said, he showed me the rock, and here it is. There were pieces of evidence that corroborated what people were saying. Norman Willis, 
Lewis Morgan and Spencer Nelson are charged with first-degree murder, accessory to murder, rape, and kidnapping for robbery. They needed money, so the obvious solution to them was, let's go steal it. Nelson had been in prison for a couple of years for a kidnap rape. Nelson's motivation, in my opinion, for killing Uribe was the prior victim, when he went to prison, identified him and testified to the rape and kidnap. So I believe that Nelson never intended to let another victim live. They're convicted and sentenced to life. But what happened to the woman whose psychic vision led police to Melanie Uribe? Never a word. Not a letter, not a phone call, nothing. They treated me like so much dirt that you kick out the door and the wind blows away, you know, with never another thought. And that really hurt. That really hurt because they were wrong. A year later, Edda Smith sues the LAPD for false arrest. Just because you're unusual, it doesn't mean you don't have rights. James Blatt was her attorney. She went out on a limb to try and find someone, although in an unconventional way, and she was successful. And for that, she was literally brutalized for four days. I got dysentery and lost 12 pounds in 72 hours. There was no probable cause for her to be arrested, simply because she found the body in an unusual way, and arresting her for that, for murder. Uh, I'm glad the jury agreed with us, and the judge agreed that having a psychic phenomenon is not probable cause to arrest someone. I'll entertain anything that might provide me with information that's helpful in a case. Police agencies have long talked to and used information from people who say they're psychic, frequently with some success. The answer to some questions is, is that there is no answer. And sometimes individuals have different gifts and they could utilize those gifts to help people. Yeah, I still pray for that lady. Every now and then she'll cross my mind or I say prayer for her and everything. And I'll never forget Melanie Uribe. I'll never forget what happened to her. Melanie was a victim of a senseless crime. I have no regrets of making the choice that I made. I didn't understand what made me do it then, but if I had it to do over, that I would do the same thing today. <laughs>